an original MCM production. I think it's a very timely program, as is evidenced by the number of people who are in the audience in order to hear this program. So we are going to talk about the, fu the future of public education in Milwaukee, and we are focusing on the K through 12 level. We know that there are issues with education at UWM, my alma mater, because I saw them in the paper this well. And uh, we know that there are also higher educational issues, but that's a different form. Okay, so what we want to focus on is uh, what are we looking at in, in the future? Okay. So, uh, my panelists are Milwaukee County Executive uh, Chris Abley, uh, Ms. Danae Davis, Executive Director of Milwaukee Succeeds, Dr. Darian Driver, Superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools, Ms. Angela McManaman, President of Parents for Public Schools of Milwaukee, because that's a national organization. And Kim, is it Schroeder or Schrader? Kim, I knew that. I told somebody that, too. It is Schrader, just because it's got it. Kim Schrader, President of Milwaukee Teachers Education Association. I thought I saw Dr. Means. Did I see Dr. Means? Where are you? Here's my glasses. Demond, I'm trying to say I thought I saw you. <laughs> okay. Who will be? Who is the superintendent of the Mequon Thamesville district, but who has also been appointed to the title? He's a commissioner. He's a commissioner. Okay. Um, of the OSPB, which is Opportunities Schools Partnership Project. Okay. So um, I'm going to start. I'm going to tell you all you got about, you have about 12 minutes, but because uh, I'm going to time you. But I mean, if you, somebody doesn't go that long, or if somebody goes a little over, I won't snatch them. Wendell, you can, you, I see you're trying to help me. So the first person who's going to speak is County Executive Abley. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, what do we all know about MPS? We need to do whatever we can to help. Uh, 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 several months ago, actually it was kind of a while ago, when I first heard about this uh, legislation uh, that was, uh, in, in theory, modeled on uh, similar legislation in uh, New Orleans, uh, and they've done something like this in Memphis, and one of the things I mentioned to the authors of the legislation is, uh, I've seen this kind of program, and I have, I've been to New Orleans, I've seen KIPP schools, I've seen what works, but I've seen what doesn't work, and this isn't the way I'd approach it. Uh, but that said, I've spent 20 years on and off whenever I can with my foundation hat on working to help education and including directly MPS. Uh, I said, uh, if I'm going to be in this, uh, one, I'm not going to be proxy for another fight. I'm not going to be proxy for an argument. I want something that's productive. I want something that adds value. And, uh, and I think we have an incredible superintendent and uh, Dr. Driver, who I got the, had the privilege of getting to know when uh, Greg Thornton uh, brought her in. And uh, no disrespect to the last couple of uh, superintendents I've worked with, but I've never been more hopeful uh, than I am uh, leadership-wise with her at the helm. Uh, I wanted to make really clear, uh, I'm not going to do anything that would hurt uh, MPS. There's uh, 80 or so thousand kids uh, who aren't part of any argument, and they deserve, as, long as, they're, as well as their families, the best education we can give them. Uh, one of the elements that was in the legislation I thought was interesting uh, and potentially a good idea is the uh, adding wraparound services. Right now, the county, um, through our Behavioral Health Division and Health uh, uh, Human Services, we provide wraparound services uh, for a lot of constituencies in the community, including at 
some degree uh, MPS. So right away, we put together essentially a menu of services that we can offer to MPS schools that don't cost anything to MPS. It, we can uh, be reimbursed for the services we provide. And the idea was through MPS, uh, through child support services, through every department we have where we, at no cost to, add, uh, to MPS, can add services, we wanted to create a menu. Uh, and part of what we've been doing in our regular meetings is uh, with Dr. Driver and Dr. Bonds is to sort of keep sharing, hey, here's what we have for a list. If there are things that are interested, let us know. Uh, if there's things that aren't, um, you know, hey, it's not a, it's not a mandate. Um, with uh, uh, the appointment, I wanted to make sure uh, that I got somebody who understood MPS, who understood Milwaukee, uh, who understood <laughs> and advocates for public schools, who shares my belief in we're not going to do anything that hurts MPS, we're not going to take over any schools, and uh, we're lucky that he's, uh, over, he's right over there. You just heard him introduced, uh, Dr. DeMond Means. Uh, who, uh, if you don't know who he is, uh, he's an impressive guy. He's worth, worth a Google. Um, but he shares my uh, 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 belief, and we don't want to spend any energy in doing anything that's advancing an argument. Uh, what we want to do is spend any energy we can that can lead to better outcomes. So some of what we've got so far, in addition to wraparound services, uh, my uh, director of child support services is here somewhere. Yeah, Jim Sullivan. And Jim Sullivan, uh, before I talk for a second about uh, how, why that matters uh, with uh, MPS, uh, has uh, for four years now led your child support services uh, uh, agency uh, in Milwaukee County. Every single one of those years we've set and broken all-time records with the number of people we're serving, and that's generally single moms bringing up kids on their own, which is important. Uh, but three years ago we started doing a lot more, and this starts connecting to where we can do something with MPS. Uh, we started doing uh, services and empowerment for the dads. Uh, it's not in the mandate, and it should be, uh, for government agencies that run child support to uh, work to empower dads. But uh, three years ago, we started uh, the Pathways to Responsible Fatherhood program. Uh, but here's why that's relevant. What it does is not for dozens or hundreds, but for thousands of fathers every year, job training, job placement, license recovery, peer counseling on how to re-engage with your kids. Because if we can't get a family back together, or the spouses back together, at least if we can re-engage them with their kids, everybody who cares about education here knows to engage parents is one of the most important variables you can have in academic success. So we just got uh, about two months ago, think so, um, the announcement that we just, our department here got the largest federal grant in the country, uh, $10 million over five years just for that program, and we have some discretion around where we can deploy it. Um, it's one of many services that connect to an element of education where no matter what we do, if we focus on some areas, working with Dr. Driver and Dr. Bonds, hey, are there some schools where this could help, we can aim services in that direction. Similarly, I've met with uh, regularly with uh, WIDA, uh, Department of Workforce Development, uh, DOT, uh, Department of Human Services, uh, all of whom at the state level, uh, because of this program, have been given the marching orders, hey, provide some services to Milwaukee uh, to help make this uh, work, uh, to help this school project work. And I've been in uh, Milwaukee a little over 20 years. And the last time during a Republican administration, departments in Madison were saying to Milwaukee, ask us for more services was never. It doesn't happen a lot. Um, so I want to make sure that we take advantage of this. Uh, and so we've been putting together also a big list of services that can be added uh, to MPS. But I want to emphasize a couple of things. First of all, all of this is transparent and with uh, uh, MPS and Dr. Driver. I don't want to do it anything otherwise. Uh, but second, this is part of it. Uh, this is part of it, but MPS is an enormous uh, organization. Um, this can help, but it, you know it needs to be a lot more than this. Uh, it needs to be all of us because uh, MPS. If we had the greatest district, and you know, and I think we've got a great leadership and a good direction, but MPS alone can't solve unemployment. It can't solve crime. It can't solve housing issues. It can't solve the economy. All of that needs to be all of us together. But one thing that's I think we have an opportunity here is to use this as an opportunity to get a lot of the departments that don't typically talk about Milwaukee, don't typically talk about working together uh, to do that. And that's what they're starting to do. Um, and uh, I'll say it again, uh, you know, uh, as I told 
the uh, legislators who uh, created this uh, uh, bill, this isn't the way I'd approach it. Uh, but what I also told them is, look, if I can help get to the outcome, the outcome of improving schools, and I don't have to, uh, without uh, taking over a school, are you guys open to that? And both of them, both of them on the record to me have said absolutely. So here's the thing, regardless of what the intent was, if we can make something positive out of this, one of the issues, and we all know this too, uh, to any meaningful change in this state, towards uh, more resources for public school typically has been getting the support of both parties. And right now, you've got two very visible Republicans' leaderships who are out there saying, hey, you know, we want to, this is what they've said, add more resources. They've said to me, you don't need to take over schools. And I'm thinking, I'm going to work with that as much as I can. And rather than spend energy on finding out what could go wrong or who's the enemy or who's the bad guy, I'm looking for what could be. And with this group, and I've been lucky enough to work with a number of the people on the panel, uh, Danae, who's speaking next, she uh, chaired my uh, transition team when I got elected. Uh, with this group uh, and the departments that are already involved, I'm sure we can. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Now, which one of you is speaking next? I let the panel determine which order. Did you, uh, Dr. Driver, did you? Okay. So I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Driver, who I just recently met when she came to um, our James Baker Award dinner, uh, although I had been reading about you. You know, so it's a pleasure to um, get to meet you in, per in person. I believe this is your first visit to CBC. Well, good morning and welcome to CBC. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy holidays. Uh, this is very encouraging to see so many people here because it tells me that we have a community that really cares about public school education. There's nothing that's more important than public school education. I was standing here because of public schools, and I think all of us can say the same thing. And so the fact that all of us, regardless, you heard how many districts were represented in this room, how many staff, where are my MPS staff? Make some noise. <laughs> MPS students, where my MPS, because I saw, where's Romero? I had several students who said hello this morning. And this speaks to the importance of this issue. And I'm sorry? Oh, oh, oh alumni. MPS oh, alumni, oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ingrid. <laughs> and we're having our alumni reunion on February 23rd, so we will make sure we get that information out to you. But all jokes aside, we really are at a critical impasse in our system. And we have the privilege to serve over 75,000 students every day. And we're a very diverse district, as all of you know. But, but this is what I want this number to, to stay in your mind. If on our record count, it's 75,551 students. But in actuality, we have already served over 79,000 students. It's only December. By the end of the year, we'll be well into eight, over 80,000. And it just speaks to the fact that these are truly all of our children. And we have to think very differently about the ways that we're going to support them to make sure that they have the resources that they need, to make sure that their families have the supports that they need to be successful. And so for us, it really is all around equity, access, and inclusion. And the way that we're approaching this work is making sure that our students have all of the opportunities deserved to them through the promise of a public education. The way, oh, thank, I'll take it. <laughs> we will take it. <laughs> But the way that we're going back, going through this really is around collective impact. And it's a buzzword, and I don't want to say too much about it because I know Danae is going to come and speak volumes about collective impact. But it's about multiple, thank you. <laughs> I, did, I didn't know how to lower it. Thank you very much. Um, it, it really is about different organizations and agencies bringing their resources, their acumen, and their strengths to the table to help us be successful and being focused on our main goal, which is student success. Uh, there are multiple elements to collective impact when you think about having backbone organizations organizations to provide support. It's about shared accountability. It's about shared resources. And so this really is all of ours to own. Clearly, I'm the leader of the school district, but I would be a fool to think that this is something that I can do by myself. You saw there's five board members here today. We have to work together, but we need everyone in this room, everyone in this community, if we're going to be able to make a change for our young people. 
And so I wanted to talk a little bit uh, just about, I know we're talking about sort of what, what's the future, what's happening, uh, what, what does this mean for MPS? Uh, but a young man told me that children aren't only our future, but they're also our now. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing now uh, to support our young people. Uh, we do have three main goals that have, that have been pretty consistent over time around academic achievement, effective and efficient operations, and parent, family, and student engagement. But I'm only going to talk about uh, four about four key objectives that fall under academic achievement, uh, because I know we have 12 minutes, and I know Dr. Malone is going to give me the hook uh, if I go over that. Uh, but I think it's important that you know how, how we're really approaching this. Um, and one is through My Brother's Keeper. We, we talk a lot about closing the gap. We know Wisconsin is home uh, to some of the worst gaps um, in the country around uh, student achievement, and particularly in Milwaukee. And so we have signed up uh, to focus on black male and Latino male achievement in our district. Uh, there are a number of initiatives that are speaking to that. Uh, one that we're very proud of is our suspension policy. Uh, we are working to reduce and eliminate suspensions in kindergarten through second grade. Our students have to be present. They have to be in school. We have to break the pipeline to prison. And this is something that our board approved several months ago that we're very excited about. But we're also honing in on literacy. It, it, it's literacy until we pass out, making sure that we're focusing not only on those foundation skills, but also key writing skills because we know that that's that's going to be that ticket that passport into life for our young people and making sure they have what they need to be successful we also have an effort around our community schools and you hear a lot around wraparound services but community schools really speak to a partnership an example, think of Our Avenue and COA's Golden Center that's right there across the street. And in partnership with United Way and with MTEA, we're able to deliver a, no deliver a number of different services and supports to our young people so that learning and support are 24-7. It isn't something that only happens in the classroom because we know that's not enough. So it really is taking everyone, everyone's collective resources to help us be successful. Another key objective for us is around educating the whole child. And it's more than rhetoric. Uh, we talk a lot about trauma. And wh what's really important to understand, it, it, it's difficult to define. It can be a number of experiences. It can be a death in the family. It can be witnessing a shooting. It can be dealing with health issues. It can be dealing with out-of-home placements. And, and what we've realized is that we have to have tools to deal with this. It's, we can't just admire the problem, but we have to give ourselves the, the tools and the strategies that are going to help us be able to reach our young people. So in January, we're doing district-wide trauma-sensitive training for all all of our staff. Uh, we're working very closely. We have a number of partners in the community who've been doing this for years. They've been doing this with individual schools, and now it's something we're trying to grow district-wide. Children's Hospital has been a big help to us, um, and a number of different partners that are making sure that we can get this done uh, for our young people and also for our teachers and for our staff, because we all need to have the tools necessary to make sure that our young people are successful. Another big strategy for us is around student attendance. And this is the area that's been a challenge for us uh, for a number of years. And we're partnering with the Milwaukee Bucks uh, to help us with student attendance. Jabari Bar Parker has personally committed 50 tickets to every Milwaukee Bucks game for Milwaukee public school students uh, to make sure the students that are coming to school every day have some incentives, some motivation. They have an opportunity to meet and interface with Bucks players. Uh, but we also have, I think most of the people in this room have had something to do with our attendance going up. Uh, and for the first First time yesterday, and I don't, I, I hate that this is on camera because if it goes down, I don't want to be misquoted. But yesterday we broke even. And so what that means, this time last year we were at 91.3% attendance. And yesterday we were at 91.3% attendance. And that may sound like, well, that's not going up. But we were down in the 80s, folks. And we have gotten in two months, we have been able to get this attendance up. So we are very excited about that. Very excited about that. And it's just the beginning. And hopefully if we come back next month, we can say the same thing is continuing to happen. Uh, another big area for us is around high schools. And, and high schools really, that's the last stop. But it's also the launch pad into the rest of the students' lives. And we have to make sure that they have all of the skills necessary and that they're fully prepared to go into, as we say, the real world, whether it's the world of work, the world of college, and just making sure that they can have productive lives. And so we had a, a committee that came together uh, over the summer. It was around 60 individuals. Some of them um, are here today uh, in partnership with the GMC all around how we're going to, to change what's happening in our high schools. And a big area for us is making sure that our students have access 
access to strong programming. And one of, the, one of those areas is through advanced placement programming. And we believe that all of our students are right for AP. Uh, we actually have at the School of Languages right now students who are receiving specialized services taking honors courses. We are trying to prepare them to take advanced placement. Uh, we're doing this in partnership with Polycom and Cisco. Uh, we have telepresence classrooms. Uh, so if you're a student, I think, at Washington, you can take a class over at Audubon and vice versa uh, if you want to take AP courses because we know that's just the beginning. But another big piece around high school is workforce development. And we want, by the end, we're revising our graduation policies as we speak, by the time they graduate to have had an opportunity to participate in either an apprenticeship, an internship, or both. Uh, because the skills that you need for the world of work are the same ones that you need in college and the same ones that you just need to have a relationship with, with from person to person. And so that's something we believe very strongly in. And again, we've had overwhelming support in trying to help us make this possible. And so uh, we, we just can't stop. There just really isn't enough that we can do to make sure that all of our young people have the opportunity uh, to be successful. And the last area that I wanted to speak to briefly uh, really was around what we call redefining the MPS experience. And we've heard for years about the challenges with obtaining driver's licenses uh, in Milwaukee. And so we are very pleased um, in partnership uh, with uh, United Way and the Center um, for Restoration of Driver's Licenses are helping us uh, with pilot a universal driver's education program. And so. <laughs> So this starts in January. Uh, we're starting at uh, Obama, uh, Career Technical Education High School, North Division, South Division, and Rufus King International. Uh, we are hoping, uh, prayerful, that we're able to raise enough money uh, so that we can take this to all of our high schools next year. Uh, but we know that this is the key. Just something as simple as a driver's license is the passport to life. And we underestimate that. It is so much more than a car. Uh, that's how you buy a home. That's how you're able to get your water turned on. That's how you're able to vote. Um, these are all things that we have to make sure that our young people have. And I'm getting the hook, so I'm going to sit down. Uh, but the last thing that I just wanted to say, first, my appreciation to all of you uh, for the work that you're doing in and out of NPS to support our young people. Know that change is happening. It is possible. We will succeed. Thank you. Be blessed. Uh, the next person I want to introduce is my very good friend, Danae Davis, from Milwaukee Succeeds. And for those of you who don't know, she was executive director of Pearls for Teen Girls, which also helped out. Um, I couldn't believe the statistics on no girls getting pregnant and almost everybody going to college. Okay, so. She has been working with MPS and even working outside of MPS for the betterment of our young women and our young people as a whole for quite some time, although she is still a young lady. Good morning, Danae. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I am absolutely amazed at how many of you are here for this very important issue. I know that a lot of it is due to Dr. Malone's um, uh, viral, whatever you want to call it, her ability to get you out. But I also choose to believe that you are here because you care. You care about our children. You care about their future. You care about our young people. You're involved. You're engaged in many ways. You believe in their future. You know that collectively, as a community, we can and must. It is immoral moral responsibility of all of us to be involved in our children's lives in a positive way and that's why you're here and I'm so very glad that you're here this morning. I want to remind us that I am from this community. Um, many of you know, I know a whole bunch of y'all. Well, I mean, we've done grown up together, we've done a lot of things together. Um, and we have been in the struggle uh, for the betterment of our community for many, many years. I came to Milwaukee, we won't say how long ago, but I came and I went to Rufus King High School. My sisters went to Custer, they went to Edison. Um, and my parents believe in education. Um, it was not even, a, a, you know, that is not an option that we weren't going to go as far as we could. And I um, was fortunate enough to go through uh, Oshkosh and ultimately Madison Law School, and my sisters, you know, did likewise. So we are from this community. We believe in this community. We were also raised to be involved in making things good and better. We cannot stand on the sidelines. We always have to ask ourselves, what more can we do? Until and unless our community is where we want it to be, that is a lifelong commitment. And so I'm here before you in my most recent venture, 
Um, so many of you know uh, throughout my history, and this isn't about me, it's about the mission, I've been very, very much involved in education. Name it, I've been in the trenches about um, quality of education for our children. And so as Dr. Malone mentioned, most recently for nine years, I was the leader of Pearls for Teen Girls. Um, we grew from 100 serving 179 girls to what I understand is now 1,604 girls in over 40 groups at over 35 sites. And these girls and young women, and many of them are now alum, are our future and are our leaders. They are making choices to be the very best that they can be. They are confident, they believe in themselves, and they are many of your um, family members, as you um, know. I believe in that our children are worth it, that our children matter. And so I was given an opportunity four years ago to serve on um, an initiative that really started, um, or the model of it started in, in uh, Cincinnati. It's called, um, the, the, or a parent organization is Strive. And the, as Dr. Driver mentioned, the uh, manner of how we serve um, education um, in a positive way is through a collective impact process. So at any rate, in 2011, the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, and I'll give all credit to um, uh, John Daniels, who at that time was the president of the board of directors for the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. And it's my understanding, I wasn't on the board, that John said th that the number one most important priority issue for the foundation was to uh, support educational outcomes and improvement of educational outcomes for all children in Milwaukee. So they determined that this impact, collective impact model, started by STRIVE, um, was the vehicle for which we could do something different in this community. What are we doing? Milwaukee Succeeds is that initiative. It started in 2011. And at its base, what it says is that Milwaukee will be united as a community around a commitment to support strategies that will achieve our shared vision of success for every child in every school, cradle to career. So our focus has been, and I've been with this organization as a volunteer for four years, and in six months ago, I had the honor to be named the executive director, which means I was the second executive director of Milwaukee Succeeds. The difference is that we choose to put our children first. I wanna say that again. We choose to put our children first. We believe that every child Every young person deserves a quality education and experience, regardless of their income, location, family background, and that adults working together can make that happen. So we focus on early childhood. We're looking at having um, all of our children, our babies, immunized on time within the first 24 months of life. We believe that um, all of our children, our babies, should have a quality early childhood experience and that part of the way that we get there is by improving the quality of child care centers. And we do that in a way that is in partnership with those child care centers. We believe that our job is to help our babies be ready for school. Second, we focus on making sure that all children succeed academically and graduate prepared for meaningful work. So that means work or college that we're focused on ensuring that all of our young people are able to read proficiently by the third grade because all of the research says that if our kids cannot read by the third grade, the likelihood of them graduating from high school is very, very slim, and we want them to be successful. So we focus on third grade reading and math. Thank you. We focus on eighth grade reading and math, and we focus on that test that you must have in order to get into col college um, or have an opportunity to go to the college of your choice, the ACT. Thirdly, we want to make sure that our um, young people use every means to be successful post high school. So whether that is jobs or whether that is a post-secondary opportunity, we want to make sure that what it takes to not only access college or apprenticeships, but also to be sex successful in that realm is made available to all of our kids because you know what, they deserve it. Now what makes this unique is, and I think if we are honest with ourselves, unfortunately Milwaukee has had some really pretty um, awful, in my word, um, politics around education. We seem to want to fight as opposed to work together. And so Milwaukee Succeeds at its heart says that all are welcome to fight for kids. 
So we want to fight for kids. We want to do what it takes, um, based on what data tells us will work, to accelerate those successful interventions to um, make it clear that our children will be successful in, um, in, in their journey from cradle to career. We, will, we work most closely with Milwaukee Public Schools. I am so honored to call Dr. Driver a fearless leader. I think that we should just really acknowledge her. She, we've had some, some good and some bad, we'll say, superintendents and leaders in, in terms of Milwaukee Public Schools or in general. But I'll tell you, this woman is amazing, amazing. She is not only smart, she's courageous, but more than anything, she is very focused. You know what? Our kids are her number one priority, and her entire team knows that. Her board of directors supports her. I mean, this is, for us who've been around a while, this is an amazing time for us to have the district be so supported, both internally, um, politically, and externally in community. The, the list of partners, and we know that because they are, they're at our Milwaukee Succeeds table. They number well over eight, um, 300 people and organizations. Many of you are involved in the work of the district and are involved in Milwaukee Succeeds. And if you aren't, I want to invite you to the table. We've got nine networks working on those issues that I just mentioned to you. And at the end of the day, this works because the community says so. This works because the resources are being aligned to support what works well for children and young people in this community. It is an unprecedented time where we put all that we have aside and focus on our children. And so I'm so very proud to be the leader of this initiative. It's only four years old. We've got goals for 2020, success goals, very specific goals on where we want our children to be. We are committed. We are committed and we are strong. And so with your support, remember that Milwaukee Succeeds is about every child cradle to career. Thank you. Okay. I'll just get down here with the mic. Um, I, um, when I, Danae, I remember when you, when you got this appointment and I read it in the paper and I said, now we're rolling. <laughs> okay, I knew we were in good shape then. Thank you. Uh, the next person is going to be Ms. McManaman. And I can't say enough about parents' involvement in schools since my mom was the head of my PTA. Okay. And at any level. You know, even in grad school, she'd go over and harass the professors. You know, but w one thing I can say, uh, <laughs> okay, one thing I can, I can say about your, 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 your specific group, you're a national organization, and we've made efforts, or we, we've said that we've made efforts in Milwaukee and in MPS at getting parents involved, but I think that in addition to individual parents of children, you also need organization. You need some kind of structure. And one thing, I was very impressed by the uh, leadership, including yourself, with your group, that you are all either current or past. Uh, your, your kids go to MPS. So um, I knew you had a, a stake in it other than organizationally. So good morning, Ms. McManaman, and welcome to Community Brainstorm. <laughs> Thank you for that warm invitation, Dr. Pam. I am indeed a parent of three children in Milwaukee Public Schools, and I have a toddler at home that I hope goes to Milwaukee Public Schools today, um, or soon, in the future. And it is a privilege to be here with you today. That's what I meant to say, that's the today part, about uh, public education in Milwaukee and education in Milwaukee overall. It's absolutely vital that we come together to talk about this, and um, thanks for being here. It's a great sign that we've got the right people in this fight. And I would say not only is everyone welcome to the fight, as uh, Danae just said before me, but everyone is needed in this fight. And I don't like using the word fight to talk about public education in Milwaukee. Um, I consider myself first and foremost a parent and a mom. And as a parent, you know you don't like to fight. And it's not a very productive way to solve problems on the home front. Um, another thing parents don't enjoy doing, I think, is repeating ourselves. And when I think about public education in Wisconsin, 
I feel like I repeat myself an awful lot, and uh, that can be frustrating sometimes. You tell your kids to brush their teeth and do their homework and make safe choices and go to bed on time, and it's hard to know if anyone's listening to you. So when I think about public education, I've been saying some of the same things for five years now since I got my call to action to be a fighter. I like to think of myself more as a problem solver. And I wonder sometimes, is anyone listening? And more specifically, are the people in Madison who make education funding decisions listening? I'm not sure about that at all. I didn't plan to take on this topic as an activist. I thought I'd always be a public school parent. Um, when I became a first-time MPS parent about 10 years ago. My husband and I had uh, one child, another on the way, and we were in the process of looking for our first home. We didn't review school test scores or tour a bunch of schools. We asked people we knew and trusted where their kids went to school. We decided what was important to us, primarily that our children be bilingual as a starting point when it came to their education. And from people we knew and respected, we learned about a school that taught children in two languages, Spanish and English, from the age of four. We were sold. We enrolled our kids in this bilingual public school, and that was it. We were Milwaukee Public School's parents. And in those early years, I would read the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and I would read about the Milwaukee Public Schools budget, and I would read about the test scores. I would read about enrollment, and I would think, wow, the problems these other schools have in the newspaper, my school doesn't seem to have. We've got a library, we have weekly art class, we have a PTA, and we have a waiting list of parents who couldn't wait to get their kids in our bilingual public school. But time passed. Uh, budget bills passed, and news coverage about Milwaukee Public Schools seemed to get more intense, more frequent, and certainly more negative. And I did start to worry. We had more kids. I would listen to school board meetings when I was in my kitchen late at night. And our third child entered this bilingual school where the class sizes got larger pretty much every year. The big change for me, what called me to be one of those people who advocates for public education, happened in 2011. Scott Walker was the brand new governor, he'd been in the job for a few weeks, and our school was bracing for a really tough budget fight within the district, we thought. So we invited Dr. Bonds, president of the school board, to come to our school. We had a PowerPoint presentation about how many kids in our school live and learn at or below poverty. A lot of children. Um, we had statistics on how many kids in our school are English language learners. It was a lot of children. We had information about our beautiful bilingual public school library that we were so proud of. It was one of the finest in the state. And we have, we had then and we have now, an incredible bilingual teaching staff that I also know is one of the best in the state. We thought we were going to show off our school and be in a strong position for the district budget situation. And we realized quickly none of it matters. Dr. Bonds got right to the point that February night and I appreciate that in retrospect. He told us pretty quickly and clearly before we could even get through our PowerPoint that the new governor was prepared to roll back public education funding in Wisconsin by several decades, enacting some major public education cuts, the likes of which Milwaukee had never seen and would struggle to recover from. He even said there were rumors the governor would cut Title I funding. And if you've ever been in a room where the temperature dropped by 10 degrees instantly and you felt like all the oxygen had left the room, that's what happened in that cafeteria of parents and kids and teachers when we heard, public ed we heard Title I funding was on the table. Thank goodness that particular item turned out to be a rumor. Nonetheless, my life changed that night. And I'll be honest, my husband and I were fairly political people. He works in politics and has his entire career. Um, but our kids' school that night, it became to me one of those schools that you read about in the newspaper. It's one of those schools where fifth graders have to start a Save My Library Club, and you have to ask fellow parents at the school, are you guys coming back next year? So I did things I've never done before after that night. Um, and I did them because everything else in Dr. Bond's budget prediction was pretty true. The 2011-13 biennial budget in the state of Wisconsin cut public education funding massively, $550 per child. It wasn't just state funding that was cut, they actually reduced the revenue limit, which was unheard of. It was a $1.6 billion 
$1.6 billion cut when you take into account what happened to the revenue limit, which means that we didn't have additional abilities to raise education funding on a community by community basis through things like referenda. And from 2008 to today, Wisconsin has experienced a public education funding cut of more than 12%. Can you imagine what would happen to every household in the state of Wisconsin if we experienced an average budget loss of 12% in less than a decade? So with friends and fellow parents, the things that I did was take, included taking all day trips to Madison to testify, waiting until 1 a.m. and then going home because I wasn't gonna get a spot in line to talk about my kids in their schools in front of the very people who were writing the legislation that affected them. I went to my first school board meetings, I wrote letters, and I co-founded um, the first Wisconsin chapter of a national organization, Parents for Public Schools. And none of that has turned out to be enough so if you want to get to the real point of today's talk about public education funding in Milwaukee, here you go. You got it, I'll keep it really quick. Um, public education funding in Wisconsin is in trouble. Um, we're living under, we continue to live, live under a low revenue limit that um, determines how much money each of Wisconsin's 424 school districts get. What we spend here in Milwaukee public schools per child is based on some arbitrary calculations that were set in Madison in the early 90s. The impact is schools receive aid based on formula. That formula has an impact on how much money our schools, our children have to learn every day. And the truth is because of that formula, students in Nicolet in Mequon, Thienesville, and Whitefish Bay and Shorewood are able to spend a lot more on their kids in their classrooms. Is that because kids in Milwaukee are worth less? Is it because they don't deserve a library? Is it because they should share one teacher with 36 classmates, while their friends in better funded school districts get to share one teacher with 18 classmates or 12? To our elected officials in Madison, I sometimes believe the answers to those questions are less. Kids in Milwaukee deserve more. And I know that's not true. And I know that attacking teachers and giving them less money and charging them more for their benefits isn't the solution either. So the solution is, <laughs> if we want to keep our best teachers, and we have excellent teachers, the best teacher corps in the state, I'm convinced, is here in Milwaukee. If we want to keep our best teachers and give our kids the best conditions under which to learn, if we want to close the achievement gap, we need to close the education funding gap first and foremost. And if Milwaukee kids are valued in the same way that kids in better funded districts are valued, we would have more money to hire more teachers. We could bring two of my kids' class sizes down from 37 to something more manageable. 37, I'm not sure what the average number is per pupil in the schools, but I can tell you my middle schooler and my high schooler each share one teacher with 36 classmates. So I would say, first of all, we have to dream big and we have to dream realistically. We can close the education funding gap. And there are parents in Wauwatosa and Shorewood and Lake Mills and Madison and Stevens Point who are willing to stand with us. And we have to believe this is possible and tell our elected officials in Madison outside the Milwaukee delegation because they do stand with us. We have to tell people in Madison this is possible that budgets are about choices first. And the choices we make and the priorities we have should drive how we spend our money, including a $1, uh, $1 billion surplus that we recently had and chose to invest in roads instead of in children. So in conclusion, I would agree. Everyone is welcome to this fight. I would demand that everyone join this fight and um, that it's possible to close the education funding gap and create a better future with our parents and our families for our children here in Milwaukee. And I have lots more to say, but I think I'm pretty close to being done. Thank you. Um, before we get to our, our final um, speaker, um, the president of uh, Milwaukee Teachers Education Association, Kim Schrader, I would like to, you know, just. Yeah, I like, you know, when you call people by their names, I like for the names to sound right. But, and, and I have to agree with Ms. McManaman, it's on the value of teachers. And that's my way of sneaking all the N MATC people in. <laughs> okay? Because I've got a lot of them here, including Mike Rosen, who is head of uh, Local 212 AFT. Uh, see, Kim, I even brought you another union president. 
I'd also like to, um, well, I've got a lot of them. Jim, I see you, even without the glasses, and I know George Stone, and you know this table is my students and some of those back there. So, so I'm proud to be, and, and I'll say, you know, that, that education, that cut, we all took it. <laughs> we all took that cut, too. Um, I want to also say that Dad Kovac is here, because I don't know where Nikki is. Uh, and Nick is my alderman, and I saw uh, Russell St Alderman Russell Stamper II over around in the corner, but when I first saw him, I didn't really recognize him, because the older you get, the more you start to look like your dad. <laughs> now, having said that, I actually thought you were him, but a little taller. Having said that, I'd like to introduce Kim Schrader, who is the president of the Milwaukee Teachers Education Association. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Malone, and thank you, everybody, for having us uh, all up here to talk about this on the Saturday morning. I thought I would start by just telling you a little bit about myself, a topic that I find interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm not from Milwaukee. I grew up in a small town up north, a really small town near Green Bay. And I went to college at Stevens Point, UWSP, and uh, I went for education. And, you know, so often, like, when you're in college, you want to change the world, right? And I remember telling my education friends, s saying, if you're, we're going to make a difference in Wisconsin, we have to go to Milwaukee. We've got to teach an MPS. And MPS came on our campus to do interviews. And I signed up, and I sat down, and the first question was, why do you want to teach an MPS? And I was like, well, actually, I really don't. I'm just here to get uh, experience interviewing. <laughs> so uh, they offered me a job, <laughs> and I felt compelled to take it um, because I really did feel that this was the place, the place to be. And I, I've been in MPS for 21 years. I taught fourth grade at Sherman School uh, until I got into the union business. So. Um, one thing we've done. One of the reasons I got involved in the teachers' union is because I saw a lack of resources for our students, for our educators in the building. And I wanted to help advocate to get those. And five years ago, uh, Bob Peterson and I were elected. Uh, he was president, I was vice president. Everything that went right in the last few years, that was me. Everything that went wrong, that was Bob, just so you know. <laughs> But we started, <laughs> oh, there's Bob, by the way. <laughs> uh, just kidding. But one of the things that was really important was us being involved in the community. We hadn't done that as an organization. And over the last couple of years, we've been out in the community. And th this, we've been fighting for different things. Uh, we've been fighting for economic justice, a fight for 15, a $15 minimum wage, because we know, we know that our students, our communities, and our families need to have family-sustaining jobs, and that will help their kids as they go to school. We've been fighting for immigration uh, rights with Voces de la Frontera. We've been, thank you. We've been fighting against the voter suppression laws and helping to get people get IDs so they can vote. And we've been fighting for racial justice. We were one of the first local unions to sign on with Black Lives Matter. And one of the things, as the MPS takeover bill came on, that I think a lot of us started to notice, the enemies we're fighting in all of these different areas are exactly the same people. They are the Bradley Foundation, Walmart with uh, the Waltons, the Koch brothers, Alex, and it goes on and on and on. And in the public education realm with the takeover, we hear their rhetoric, the rhetoric of, we need to do something to help MPS. We need to uh, change public schools because somehow it's failing. And to an average person, that, makes, that may sound like that's true. But the fact is, these people have done nothing, nothing to help our communities and our societies. And you can't use logic with them and you can't appease them. They are out to destroy us in whatever way they possibly can. So we have to decide that we're going to fight back. And that's what we're doing on the takeover. Not one school, not one, can go into the hands of these people. And it's not just a Milwaukee problem. 
This is happening throughout the nation. Almost every major city in the United States has either had a takeover happen or is undergoing an attempt. 98% of the students affected have black and brown skin. If this is such a great idea, and if this was all about helping MPS and public school students, why aren't we seeing it in Whitefish Bay? Why aren't we seeing it in Oak Creek? And I think Angie touched on it very eloquently. Public schools have been set up to fail. They have been set up to fail. We had a school in Milwaukee, we still have that school, Our Avenue, which was a 90-90-90 school, meaning it had 90% of its students who had free or reduced lunch below the poverty level, 90% students of uh, black or brown skin, and a 90% basic or higher rating on the reading and math scores. It was a successful school. That was 10 years ago. With the budget cuts it's had, losing librarians, losing uh, specialists, great teachers, increasing classroom sizes, it's now considered, in quotes, failing. This has been set up. This is not an accident. This is the plan. And we know what the answers are. We know what the answers are. It is to increase funding, but it's not to increase funding to keep doing the same thing. We're all about improving. Even when you're doing well, you can improve. There are models out there that we can follow. Community schools, for example. Senator Larson and Assemblyman Barnes actually put forward a bill in our state legislature to fund and grow community schools. It didn't go anywhere. Instead, a takeover comes which has no, no basis on how it's going to improve. Community schools have, uh, are right now in our country, about six million students are in community schools. Their test scores are high. The community loves them. They're successful in Oakland and Cincinnati. It's models to follow for communities and states that decided that public education and our students are something we want to invest in. Community school has wraparound services. It teaches the whole child, uh, not just reading and math, but art, music, gym. Parents in the community actually set what the curriculum is, what we want to learn. And then it goes beyond that. It actually teaches and helps the whole community, bringing in nutrition services, uh, medical services, all sorts of things. But we don't do that. No, instead, we talk about we got to take money out of public schools and put it to private schools that can do a better job, even though there's no actual study anywhere showing that they do. This is an attack on us. It's the largest public system left, and it, they are trying to end it. We either stand up to this or we lose. We cannot appease these people. Public schools are those schools that report to a publicly elected school board so people have a voice. The problem with the privatization plan, the voucher plan, the corporate charters, is every school does not teach every child. MPS does. Angie also spoke about not wanting to use the word fight. I'd actually, I'm going to use the word war. We are at a war. We don't have time for this, any division amongst us. We need to stand up to the people who are trying to destroy us. It's going to take all of us. It cannot just be the MTEA. It can't just be MPS. It cannot just be uh, a couple people standing off to the side. The only way we beat these people who are trying to destroy our communities and our lives and our children is to stand up and say no more. So thank you. You know, when, when people actually stick to the time limit, you know, and I'm in the back talking, it really does uh, create a problem. But uh, Nick, did you hear me talking about you behind your back? Oh, Alderman Kovac? It's at, okay. I, I, I was talking about you behind your back, but Dad Kovac was here, so. Okay, it's, it's, it's the time that many of us, oh, no, no, you had a couple more minutes, so I, because you were going to elaborate on something. Jim Sullivan, even, you, where are you? 
I know you didn't know you were going to be on the spot, but he had a couple more minutes because he didn't want me saying anything. So he just wants you to do a couple minutes on the fatherhood initiative because it, it really relates to um, public education. Okay, we do have a lot of young fathers out here. Okay, and they have to be fathers and students. Or so, if you could just. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much. And uh, no, I did not know that I was going to be uh, up here today. Okay. Um, but I'm Jim Sullivan. I am the Milwaukee County Child Support Services uh, Director. And one of the things where I think there's some overlap here and some support that's uh, available is some of the ways that uh, the county executive has asked us to bring together some, uh, some support and some additional programming for the Opportunity Schools project, uh, which I think uh, is a, a, a great uh, kind of... Um, uh, mutually supporting function. Uh, in child support services, uh, as the county executive mentioned, we have a, a program called Pathways to Responsible Fatherhood. Uh, that has been fantastically successful over the past several years. We've been serving 1,750 low-income dads here in the Milwaukee area. Uh, Al Holmes, who's been so, doing such a great job feeding us here at the community brainstorming, has been a big part of that success. Uh, Chris has asked us to take the Pathways to Responsible Fatherhood program and bring that to bear on the Opportunity School program to be able to offer some of those wraparound kind of services. So who's involved in that? Uh, that is uh, my father's house, that is the YWCA, that is um, Next Door Foundation, a number of different uh, agencies that are doing a great job right here in the Milwaukee community to come in and to be able to work with these dads, to connect dads to their families, connect dads to jobs. Well, we did such a great job with that. The federal government, when they renewed that, which almost no one was renewed, we were renewed for five years for $10 million. So that is $2 million a year that is going directly to support low-income fathers in this community. Um, and in terms of wraparound, we're talking about everything from driver's license recovery to AODA issues to peer-to-peer uh, um, uh, -peer counseling. It's uh, been a truly inspiring program. So we're bringing that to bear uh, on the Opportunity School program. We're also going to be able to uh, bring a program called Child Support 101, which helps to provide some basic demystification of how the child support process works. Uh, it's something that we've done a great job with uh, at the uh, Milwaukee Fatherhood Initiative Summit, which is held every October. We've worked with thousands of dads there. We've written off over $10 million in past state due child support support arrears to be able to give people a, a fresh start. Uh, and I think that Child Support 101, uh, Child Support in Your Neighborhood, where we go out and we're working with some of the uh, uh, moms and the dads, the whole family out in the community, uh, has been tremendously successful. And in partnership with the Obama administration's efforts with My Brother's Keeper, the new Pathways grant is focusing primarily on younger dads. So we're talking about guys who are 16 to 24 years old. So this is directly who we're talking about with this Opportunity School program. Uh, I think that uh, it's uh, um, a, a, a useful uh, thing for us to do in order, rather than just trying to recreate the wheel when Chris has asked us to be able to bring these kinds of programs to bear on this Opportunity School program. To me, that is more resources, that's greater help, uh, that's greater uh, success and outcomes, uh, and I don't feel, I don't look at something like that, uh, and I do not see a takeover in that. I see additional resources and help. Thank you. Okay. He, he stopped. He knew that. An MCM production.